Hello, this video is about Neuroleptic Malignant Syndrome or NMS and as usual I'll put all the sources I've used to make this video in the description below. So how do you diagnose NMS? Well, there's no universally agreed criteria, but I'll be using the criteria in the DSM as they're the most popular ones out there. So they say that you have to have hyperthermia, rigidity, a raised creatinine kinase, an altered mental state and autonomic dysfunction. And this can be either tachycardia, hypertension or even tachypnea. And you have to have all of these features. And they also specify that you have to have uh, been on a dopamine antagonist or had the dose increased in the last 72 hours. And you could have also had a dopamine agonist withdrawn as in the case of Parkinson's meds. But if you don't have any medication that interferes at the dopamine receptor, then you shouldn't be diagnosed with NMS according to the DSM. And that makes sense from a mechanism point of view. So what is the mechanism exactly? I'll go through what the traditional thinking was. So the traditional thought was that you have antagonism at the D2 receptor, which is one of the dopamine receptor subtypes. And it basically says that the D2 receptors in the hypothalamus are responsible for a homeostatic response. And if you block them, you get increased temperature, increased muscular rigidity, and then you get altered mental state through various parts of the brain having downregulated dopamine transmission. The things that support this are that um, we know that dopamine signaling is really important in the hypothalamus and also in the case of Parkinson's disease we know that when people lack dopamine uh, firing neurons in their substantia nigra then they get, tend to get rigid and um, tremulous and they get some of the other features of uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome including autonomic instability. And we also know that if you abruptly stop Parkinson's disease medications like levodopa, you can precipitate a case of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So, so far, so good. All sounds like it fits with um, dopamine receptor antagonism at the D2 receptor. However, there's a couple of things that kind of put some doubt onto this side of the um, theory. And that's what the main thing is basically that atypical antipsychotics cause neuroleptic malignant syndrome as well as typical antipsychotics and one of the main differences between these two groups is that atypical antipsychotics should have less activity at the D2 receptor and if they had less activity at the D2 receptor we'd expect a much lower incidence of NMS with atypical antipsychotics and that's not something that's really materialized. So there's a few other hypotheses for why this might have happened and the most popular one is that NMS is a form of malignant catatonia, i.e. Uh, which used to be called lethal catatonia. And they basically argue that there's a spectrum involving mutism, stupor, and sometimes rigidity, and then decreased activity and altered mental state that goes all the way from mild to moderate, and then in the severe end would include neuroleptic malignant syndrome. But it's these shared features that argue, make people argue that they're part of the same entity. And the other thing is that some of the treatments for malignant catatonia also seem to work reasonably well for NMS. And one of those is electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, and another one is benzodiazepines like lorazepam, which has been used traditionally for catatonia, but can also be used for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So what are the other treatments you can do for NMS? Well, the most important thing you can do is to cease the neuroleptic, i.e. cease the agent that has caused NMS to develop. The second most important thing to do in the treatment of NMS is to make sure the patient stays um, at a comfortable ambient temperature and doesn't get overly hot. And that's because the hotter patients get when they have NMS, the worse their outcomes are and the more um, severe their toxicity and the more organ failure they tend to get. So that might just be ensuring a cool ambient temperature, but if their temperature starts to rise, especially once it gets above 39 degrees, you need to start rapidly cooling them with IV fluids, external cooling measures, and maybe even consider intubation and ventilation to reduce heat produ production by muscles. Other than that, the treatment is mostly supportive and managing the autonomic instability, managing behavior. If you're gonna use sedation, then you absolutely cannot use an antipsychotic for obvious reasons. You don't want to increase the level of dopamine blockade, but you can use titrated doses of benzodiazepines. Finally, you can use some specific pharmacological measures, i.e. dopamine agonists. This is a little controversial in that their use is not supported by good randomized controlled trials, but 
they are used in clinical practice and they have been reported to be effective. So I'm just going to mention one of them, which is the dopamine agonist bromocryptine, which can be basically increased from 2.5 up to 5 milligrams uh, orally uh, three times a day. But the mainstay of treatment that you need to remember is supportive treatment with a focus on maintaining a normal temperature.